Well, today we come to week 10 of our study, sort of our summer study in the life of Joseph. Joseph is my favorite Old Testament Bible character. And uh, even though the filling of the Holy Spirit really doesn't come full bore until you get into the book of Acts and the New Covenant, I, I think we see a parallel between brothers of Joseph, the change that they had, and something that happens inside every believer who becomes indwelt and filled with the Holy Spirit. And that is, we get uh, we come into the and screaming, it's all about me, the big number one, me first, others second, and we diss Jesus. And uh, the fruit of the Spirit is joy, J-O-Y, Jesus first, others second, and me last. And I think what happens to Joseph's brothers in chapters 42 to 44, and by the way, I committed all kinds of homiletical um, I took all kinds of homiletical freedoms two weeks ago that, that, that would not have passed an expository preaching class. It was unwise to try to cover three chapters in one day. But I wanted to show you how God moved in the brothers to move them from a place of, of hardness of heart to a place of repentance. And so that's why we did that. And then today, we're going to look at Joseph's revelation to his brothers of himself. So, uh, getting back to when you're filled with the Spirit, one thing that begins to change in your life is you begin to put others first before yourself. And, uh, you know, that is, there were three areas of concern that Joseph had as vizier or prime minister of Egypt. He needed to see if his brothers had a change of attitude towards the evil that they had committed against him 19 years earlier when at the age of 17 they sold him. And in chapters 42 to 44, they say, we are guilty. We heard the distress of our brother who was pleading for his life from the pit, and we sold him into slavery. And then he needed to see if they had a change of heart towards his full brother. You see, the ten brothers who had sold him to the Ishmaelites were his half-brothers, same dad, different moms. But Benjamin, his younger brother, was his full brother, and he had to see if the, the brothers had a change of heart towards Benjamin. Or would they sell him out as the son of the favored wife of Jacob, their, their father, like they did so many years ago with Joseph. And they found, he found at the end of chapter 43 that when he gave Benjamin five times as much food as he had given to any of his other brothers, they did not even raise an eyebrow. In fact, they would not sell Benjamin out. They would go to death for Benjamin. So he saw that they had a change of heart towards him and the evil they had committed against him, even though he hadn't revealed himself to them yet. He had a, they had a change of heart towards Benjamin. And then he had to see if they had a change of heart towards their dad, because they had lied to dad for 20, uh, well, let's see. They sold him into slavery when he was 17. He became prime minister of Egypt when he was 30. And then when we begin chapter 45, there's two years into the famine. So there's 19 years, or, um, oh, I'm getting my math wrong. Help me out here. That's 13, 15 years. Is that right? 15 years. Sorry about that. Um, and, and if you look at the end of uh, chapter 44, notice the change of heart. When Judah, as the man for the brothers, he says, For how shall I go up to my father if the lad, that is Benjamin, is not with me for fear that I see the evil that would overtake my father. So, uh, something has happened to these brothers, has begun to soften these brothers. And uh, I believe that when we get into Genesis 45, we're at the very apex of the life of Joseph, the climax. Now, we're going to spend probably another five or six Sundays you know, finishing out the book, uh, but the climax is today. This is the high point. This is one of the greatest love chapters in the entire Bible. Um, and and I, I believe it has great implications for what I call reconciliation. You know, there are many word pictures that Scripture gives us of the Gospel. And one of them is that you and I are at odds with God, and God is at odds with us. That is, when we're born into this world. And you and I live that out in everyday relationship. How many of you, marrieds, have ever had the experience of going to bed with your spouse and giving them the silent treatment? Don't, don't raise your hand, okay? 
Because if you haven't had that experience, you're probably not human. Um, but there was an estrangement there. There was hostility. You could feel it in the air, right? How many of you parents have had the experience of uh, your teenage son or daughter giving you the silent treatment? And you just wanted to know what's going on under the shell of their heart. And they just close you out. Have you had that experience? You see, a lot of us grew up, and, and I, I'm blessed because I never heard my mom and dad raise their voice at each other. It, it's, it, and, and I say that with clear conscience before God and men. They weren't perfect. They had their sin issues. But I never heard them get into a heated argument where my dad started yelling expletives in profanity and started going crazy. Um, but most of us have been around that. And, and what reconciliation pictures is that there's an estrangement, either on a horizontal human level, or vertically between God, our Creator, and His. And reconciliation is moving us from hostility to harmony. We're two people that weren't on speaking terms. Maybe you've removed them from your contact list. Maybe they hurt you and went to a different church. Or they said something about you on Facebook by implication that was painful and so you have chosen not to pursue them or have contact with them so we all feel this very deeply at some level at some point in our life where there's an estrangement and the doctrine of reconciliation takes us to this beautiful aspect is where there's formerly a wall there's now a bridge <laughs> where there's formerly now uh, for where there was formerly a chasm a there's now this beautiful grace bridge from one party to the other. And I love this. This is one of the most beautiful chapters on God's love in the Bible. And so, you know, I, I want to say this. I do not personally feel free to say that Joseph is a type of Christ. Okay? Um, many that are much smarter than I'll ever be would disagree with that. Uh, but I am saying that I feel free to see parallels between Joseph and Jesus. To say that he is a picture in some implications of Jesus. And so what I'm doing today is I'm choosing to look at this story, particularly the first 15 verses, from the standpoint of how God reconciles us to Himself. Okay, And then I believe it has some implications for how we should be forgiving of other people that have hurt us, that have offended us, from whom we are estranged. How many of you could quote from memory Ephesians 4.32? Can I see your hand? All right. I bet more of you can do it. Be ye kind one to another. Help me out. Tenderhearted. Forgiving one another, even as God in Christ Jesus has what? Forgiven you. So the vertical connection fuels our horizontal forgiveness. In other words, the fact that God gave us off the charts means that we should have forgive little offenses towards our spouse, towards our kids, towards our parents. They're overbearing and unfair. Sometimes they are. Sometimes I've been as a dad. Uh, towards our brothers and sisters in Christ. So the, the, the oil that, that gives the squeaky wheel of forgiveness towards others is knowing that I've been forgiven in Christ. And the more I look at those songs that Vaughn led us in and others that we sing about the Gospel, it fuels a different spirit towards other sinners around me because I know I've been forgiven so much. So we're going to look at four things uh, from chapter 15. Uh, the first thing I want you to write down is just the point that God knew us before we know Him. Uh, if you look at this, in chapter 42, verse 8, it says that Joseph had recognized his brothers, although they didn't recognize him. So at that point, he dressed up in Egyptian garb. He's speaking Egyptian, not Hebrew. Uh, all these years have elapsed uh, since they last saw him. I guess, you know what, I did my math. Because there was the 13 years plus the 7 years of of plenty, so that's 20, so 22 years. <laughs> Sorry, I'm doing this little gymnastic in front of you. But it was 22 years. But during that time, uh, Joseph had changed, 
But his brothers, he could recognize him. He could tell Simeon and Levi and Judah and Reuben and Naphtali and Benjamin were. Now, I don't think he'd seen Benjamin until Benjamin, since Benjamin was a little tyke. <laughs> but he recognized them. But it's now in chapter 45, because he sees that they have had a change of heart towards him, towards Benjamin, towards Jacob, towards their sin and their deception for 20 some odd years, that he reveals himself to them. Um, yeah, chapter 42, verse 8 says, Joseph had recognized his brothers, although they didn't recognize him. He's disguised to them. And you know, I, I think all of us who know Jesus, who treasure Jesus, who have submitted to Jesus, can look back at it and we were just like the Jews of the first century world. Remember it says that when Jesus came, He came to the world, the one who created it, and the world didn't know Him. And the world didn't receive Him. In fact, He came unto His own, the Jews, and they did not receive Him. John 1, 10 and 11. And I think... All of us could look back at a time in our life when the God of this world, Satan, had blinded our minds and our eyes so that we could not see the light of the glorious gospel of Christ. Think about that Negro spiritual, sweet little G boy. They made you be born in a manger. Sweet little holy child. Didn't know who you was. Didn't know you'd come to save us, Lord, to take our sins away. Our eyes was blind. We couldn't see. We didn't know who you was. And here's the point. Just as Joseph knew his brothers long before they knew him, God knew us long before we came to know him. Uh, in Psalm 139, particularly in verse 15 and in verses 1 to 4, David is reflecting on the omniscience of God. That it's not a passive thing, it's an intimate thing. That from the formation in our mother's womb, the Lord knew us. Uh, he knew when we would lie down and when we would get up. He could perceive our thoughts from afar. I think of the Apostle Paul in Galatians 1, 15 and 16, where it says, it pleased the Lord... Uh, from my mother's womb to reveal that I would be called as an apostle to the Gentiles. Now the calling as an apostle to the Gentiles happened on the road to Damascus as an adult male. But there was something going on at Paul's birth that implies that God knew him, that he was thoroughly known. In fact, we could say that God knew us from eternity past. If I ask you to define eternal life for me, I hope you would say that to know God and His Son Jesus is eternal life. Because that's what John 17.3 says. But here's the thing. Joseph, during the episode of, of Genesis 42, 43, and 44, he knew his brother's lies. He knew their cover-ups. He knew fully all the yuck in their past the dirty laundry in their closet, the skeleton in their closet, and yet he still was pursuing them. <laughs> and you know, I was thinking about this yesterday as my wife and I were having, a, I guess, a time of confession, which, by the way, I would encourage you marrieds to do, because James 5 talks about confessing our sins one to another. And as we had a time of confession, just, just in our own intimacy of our marriage, I thought back and, and I prayed and I said, Lord, thank you. Before time began, and you set your love upon me, and you knew me, you knew all of the sins that I would do, the big big ones and the little ones and the medium-sized ones, the ones in the past, the ones that I'll do this afternoon, even a thought that transgresses your law, and the things I'll yet do in the future, and you knew me, and you pursued me. <laughs> and that just blows me out of the water. Second point, I think we see. A parallel between Joseph and his reconciliation to his ten brothers and ours with God is that he loved us before we love him. You know, one of the greatest things that God has done is given us tear ducts. You know, we men, we macho men, we don't like to cry. We don't like to be seen tearing up. But I think two of the great men in the Bible, Joseph and the greatest perfect man who ever lived, Jesus Christ, showed that they had tear ducts. 
there are seven times, and I'm not going to take time to get into this, but there are seven times that we see Joseph crying, but no more climactic than in verses 1 and 2 and in verses 14 and 15. In fact, if you look at it, he says, everybody, all the Egyptian servants, go out from me. This is in chapter 45. And so there was no uh, non-Hebrew with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. Notice, he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it and the household of Pharaoh heard of it. That's, that's a lot of wailing going on. That's Niagara Falls type of crying going on. Look at verse 15. Or verse 14, he fell on his brother Benjamin's neck and he wept. And Benjamin wept on his neck. He kissed all his brothers. That's sort of like a, a cultural abrazo, a big bear hug, a cultural kiss, right? Between brothers. You know, I, I love this because Joseph has just been dying on the inside for all of these two decades. Think about it. He's a Hebrew. He's with the Egyptians. He has no, you know, I grew up playing 42, drinking iced tea, mama's fried chicken, listening to the Cowboys with my dad before we had a TV. And then suddenly I'm forced out of all of my comfort zone and I'm placed in a remote tribe as a 17-year-old boy. And they don't even know what fried chicken, Dallas Cowboy football, or iced tea look like. And I live in that idolatrous environment for decades. And I'm, my heart is hurting. I want relationship with my mom and my dad. And I want relationship, well, in Joseph's case, his, bro, his mom had already died. But I want relationship with my half-brothers. I particularly want to build a relationship with the brother I really never knew. My younger, full brother, Jim Benjamin. But I have to see if my brothers are really repentant. And I find out that they are. And now it's time to just let the tears out. Now the question we have to ask is, when did his love for his brothers begin? Now the best of men are men at best, so we can't say that Joseph's love for his brothers was perfect. We cannot suggest that his soul and his conscience and his thoughts all of these two decades never struggled with bitterness. Although we're not seeing that, the Holy Spirit doesn't tell us that. But what I'm saying is, I believe that all during this time of separation and estrangement from his family, Joseph is longing for relationship with his brothers. And in a far infinite greater way, the Father set His love upon us, not at the time we trusted in Jesus as Savior and Lord, but in eternity past, He said He loved the nation Israel with an everlasting love. And by the way, there's a Bible verse, and here's you track with this. God demonstrated His love toward us. And that while we were such wonderful, incredible, couldn't help Himself type of people, are you tracking with that? Russ has given me a dirty look, and I'm glad. <laughs> God demonstrated His love toward us in that while we were yet what? Sinners. Christ died for us. You want to know the definition of love? Don't wait for Valentine's Day. Go to the Valentine card that John gives us. 1 John 14, Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that God loved who? us and gave his son to be the propitiation for our sin i think that joseph has held back for so long and now he just lets it all gush out offers the forgiveness the provision the blessing the reconciliation he's got it all ready for him and he just gushes it because they have come to that point where they say we're guilty we're guilty We've sinned against God. God has seen what we did to our brother so many years ago. You see, God didn't start loving you when you trusted in Him. He loved you from eternity. He planned to save you if you know Christ, if you're one of His own. And He intends someday to hold you up as an exhibition of His grace in heaven. Now there's another man 
This would be a great study for your care group. We're talking about the tear ducts. Jesus was called a man of sorrow, acquainted with what? Grief. He cried at the tomb of Lazarus in John 11.35. And in verse 36, the, the Jews said, oh, how he loved him. He wept over the city of, of Jerusalem and he said, oh, how I wish I could have gathered you, my people, but like a hen would gather in her chicks, but you refused me. And God, even in our B.C. days, He was pursuing us. And at the Garden of Gethsemane, according to Hebrews 5.7, in the days of Jesus' flesh, He offered up both prayers and supplications, listen to this, with loud crying and tears to the One who is able to save Him from death. Now, how did Joseph show love to his brothers? Well, at minimum, he offered them grain. 3,000 years before Marcia's bread basket opened at 252 Cutlass, and 2,000 pounds of wheat from Wheat Montana Farm sat in our garage, these men had to go for miles from the land of Canaan to Egypt to buy grain because bread was their sustenance. And some uh, 1,800 years later, I believe it is, Uh, Jesus Christ announces, I am the bread of life. I am the living bread that comes down out of heaven. And right before He goes to be tried and crucified, He says to His own, take and eat of this bread. It's My body which is given for you. So, you see, God set His love upon you in eternity past. And He so loved that He gave Himself not The 50-pound bag of wheat Montana grain for your bread, but He gave Himself as the very bread to be broken on a cross so that we could have life. I think a third Gospel declarative implied in this beautiful story is that God set our salvation in motion even before we knew we were lost. Did anybody before you knew Jesus ever walk up to you and say, are you saved? Because I venture to say, you might have answered them by saying, from what? What are you talking about, dude? I was, I was walking down to my mom's house, just kind of praying and meditating before coming to church this morning, and I saw my neighbor out, you know, working in his yard, and, and I thought to myself, I thought, most people on Cutlass Drive don't even have a clue that they're lost. And I believe that Joseph's brothers, for maybe up to two decades, didn't have a clue that they were lost. I mean, they lied about it, they sold out their brother, and to think that ten guys could sit around with dad, however that looked like in their culture, day after week, week after week, year after year, and cover up their lie about their bro is amazing. But then we saw this two weeks ago in chapters 42 through 44. Joseph invades him. He says three times, You're spies, you're spies, you're spies. He puts the cup of divination in their bag. He returns their money to them. He's pressing in on them. For three days, he makes them sit in the same prison that he sat for many years, adjoining Potiphar's house. And Joseph is pressing in on them. He's working behind the scenes to save them through solitary confinement. These difficult things. He's removing the crutches out from underneath them. Listen to me. I think it was harder for the brothers to come to the point of saying we're guilty than it was for Joseph to announce, I am Joseph. Because the provision of salvation is right there. Jesus was willing to go to the cross. But to get a man or a woman to bow their knee to Jesus, now that can take a long time. I'm told that in Chicago there's a a play place where you have to be able to walk upright through the entrance in order to qualify to play in that play place. And when the Chicago Tribune reported on this play place, they captioned the article and the picture with this statement. 
their size is their ticket. Their size is their ticket. In other words, you had to be small in order to enter into the privileges of playing in that play place. You see, before a man or a woman or a child can receive grace, they have to be humbled. They have to be broken. I love the way John Newton put it. He said, "'Twas grace that taught my heart." Can you help me out? "'Twas grace that taught my heart to what? And grace my fears relieved. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And you know, these men, they had to go through all these hurdles. Dad looking at them in chapter 42 and saying, why are you staring at one another? Get down there to Egypt. He didn't know. He was having them face the skeletons in their closet. There's grain there. We're going to die if you don't take care of this. And then, uh, you know, <laughs> they're hoping they can just go back and get Simeon and not have to deal with his pretty, what they perceive to be a malicious prime minister. You know, before we came to Christ, our thinking of God was not always good. We probably drew back in horror at some level. But you see, God has to break us and bring us to the point of necessity. Sometimes He does that through a health report, through a breakup in a marriage, through a death, through an estranged relationship, through getting fired from a job. He can use a combination of things, of crises in our lives. And so Joseph and his steward goes out and pursues the caravan heading back to Canaan. And he said to them, you're guilty. And eventually the brothers came to that point of saying, yes, we are. Listen to these words in 1 Peter 1, 1 and 2. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, Listen to this. Who were chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Here's the, listen to the trifecta. The Trinity. By the sanctifying work of the Spirit to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with His blood. Isn't there, isn't there three members of the Godhead that are all involved in our salvation? The Father chooses us. The Spirit sanctifies us. The Son died for us. Think about the three agents that God used in the lives of these brothers to bring reconciliation. The, uh, the father, Jacob, said, guys, get down there to Egypt and get us some grain. We've got to eat. We've got to have food. A man's got to have his chow, right? Uh, and then there was the steward pointing the finger. You guys took it. It's in your bag. Give it up. And then there's um, Joseph giving, showing them kindness. You know, treating him to a banquet. We saw that. And, and at this point, you see, it takes some doing. It takes the Trinity, the eternal Godhead, bringing all their eternal counsel of their will and their pleasure to effect our salvation, our rescue from sin and all of its effects. And uh, notice the point that these brothers had been brought to. Look at chapter 45, verse 3. It says that his brothers couldn't answer him, for they were dismayed at his presence. So he spills the beans. I'm brother. He's gushing, emotional, lamenting so loud that the Egyptians hear of it. You know, they, they, they were speechless. Did you the... Most biblical term for men in the presence of God is the word shut up. So some of you might go home today and somebody might shut up. He told, told us to shut up. You want, to be, you want to give you a biblical basis for that? Listen to these verses. Galatians 3.22 But the Spirit has shut up everyone under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Romans 11.29 God has shut up all, that is, the ethnic Jew and the non-Jew, in disobedience that He might show mercy to all. Now, Romans 3.19, listen to this. We know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth might be closed or shut up, 
and the whole world be held accountable to God. Shut up, shut up, shut up. You see, you, you reach a point as you think about how God reconciled you where you got nothing to say. You can't blame it on your mom with red hair. That that's why you have a problem with anger. You can't blame your problem with pornography on your, uh, your uncle. Um, you know, you, 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 you just, you're, you're, you're not answering God because you feel the weight of, i got no leg to stand on in the presence of a holy God. And I think that's what these brothers are doing. They, they come to this point of saying, you know what, I've got no excuses. I don't even know what to say. I think they're even drawn back, like, whoa, this guy's gonna, he's gonna nail us. Well, we know that. We'll get to that later. Let me give you a fourth gospel nugget by implication here. Not only did God knew us, not only did he know us before we knew him, not only did he love us before we loved him, not only did he set our salvation in motion even before we knew we were lost, but fourthly, he bids us come when we wanted to flee. And if you look at this in verse 4, Joseph, after his brothers uh, almost implies that they're, well, they're dismayed and that, that they might have drawn back or wanted to, look what he says. Come closer to me. Come closer to me. Does that remind you of anybody, anybody in the New Testament? Let me, let me give you a verse and see if you can fill in the blanks. Come unto me, all you that are weary and heavy laden. Anybody tracking with this? Matthew eleven twenty eight to 30. Jesus. He says, I'm meek and lowly of heart, and I'll give you rest for your souls. You take my yoke upon you, and you love me. I'll give you a, a light burden. I'll, I'll meet you in your... That's, that's mercy. And, and I think the brothers get something far better than mercy. Mercy is, I deserve hell. I deserve the lake of fire. I deserve the wrath of God. And God, when I believe in Jesus Christ as my only hope of salvation, God cancels out my debt. And I miss out on all that bad stuff. I get transferred out of the domain of darkness, run by Satan, the prince of darkness. But grace is better because grace is God giving me lavishly what I don't deserve. Look at verse 7. Joseph is just pouring it on. He says, God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant in the earth and to keep you alive by great deliverance. And I realize that the primary reason that Jesus came and died is not for us, but for the Father to please the Father to glorify the Father. But listen to these words from Isaiah 53, 5 and 6. He was wounded for our transgressions. That's you and me if we know Christ. That brought us peace was placed upon Jesus. See, God... extended fellowship to them he longed there's a beautiful picture of this in verse 10 and then particularly in verse 15 look at it i think the stronger mention of it is in verse 15 it says he kissed all his brothers and wept on them and afterward his brothers talked you see it wasn't just a quick let's get together let me give you the four spiritual laws and boom you call on jesus to save you and i'll see you in five weeks joseph longed for communion with his brother he wanted relationship. He wanted a relationship that had been estranged for decades. He longed for them. And in verse 10, he invites them to go back and get dad and their family and live in the land of Goshen and to be near him. You know, it's beautiful that when you get called to salvation, you don't just get called to live in the outer courts of the Gentiles. You get to enter the very presence of the Holy of Holies in the presence of God through the person of Jesus. 
who's praying for us at the right hand of the Father right now as we sit here. And then He provides for them. Look at verse 11. There I will also provide for you, for there are yet five years of famine to come in you and your household, and all that you have would be impoverished. And it just gets better because down by verse 18, Pharaoh says, take your father and your household and your Come to me and I'll give you the best of the land of Egypt. And you'll eat of the fat of the land. I mean, it would be one thing if God had just said, you know, Ben, when you believed in Jesus, the only hope of salvation, I would, I would promise you that every ounce of anger and wrath I had aimed at your head because of your sin was exhausted down. Something more than that. I'm going to not only drain it down to the bottom of the cup, all the bad stuff, I'm going to take that Starbucks spiritual latte pitcher and I'm going to fill it up to overflowing with every spiritual blessing that's in Christ. I'm going to give you, Ben, an inheritance that is imperishable, uh, will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. I'm going to adopt you as my son. I'm going to purchase you from the slave market of sin. I'm going to treat you as if you had lived the obedient life of my son Jesus, even though you haven't, even for 24 hours. I'm going to do all of that and much more. Just lavish provision. I want you to go back to verses 14 and 15 because it says he fell on his brother Benjamin's neck and he wept, and Benjamin wept on his neck all his brothers and wept on them, and afterwards his brothers talked to him. Think, I'm using a little bit of sanctified imagination here. I know this isn't specifically or explicitly in the text, but I really believe that when Joseph went to Benjamin, it's like he grabbed him, he kissed him, and he said, Benjamin. He called him by name. I think he went to Naphtali. Naphtali. He kissed him. He wept over him. I think he went to Judah, the one who had said, you know, guys, so many years ago, let's not uh, kill him. I mean, after all, he is our brother. Let's just sell him. And I think he said, Judah, I love you. And he kissed him and he wept over him. And you know, I think there's an intimacy. I don't think God calls any two people at exactly the same time time in exactly the same in exactly the same way i think he had a unique calling when he called john gardea it wasn't just john i mean how many johns are there in el paso john what's your middle name john paul gardea (laughs) listen to these words of the good shepherd in john 10 To him the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by what? By name and leads them out. You want a picture of this? Remember a little runt tax collector dude in Luke? I don't know if we have any Zeds here. His name was Zacchaeus. Any names that start with Z? (laughs) And Zacchaeus is too little to see Jesus. Jesus coming through he's doing important stuff but he wants to get a glimpse of jesus and jesus turns to him in the tree and he says i can't. and he calls him by name i'm coming to your house today and later on he said today salvation has come to this house now there's another thing. Verse 13 he not only gives them privileges and provision and intimate fellowship but he gives them a commission He gives them a job to do. Look at verse 13. Now you must tell my father of all my splendor in Egypt and all that you have seen and you must hurry and bring my father down here. He gives them a job to do. You see, we're not just the frozen chosen. We're not just to sit in our holy huddle. We're not to be rabbit hole Christians. I know this fall in the care groups we're going to launch an intensive study of soul care. But we are not cul-de-sacs. We are conduits. Because our commission is to make disciples of all nations. Starting with our loved ones and our co-workers and our classmates and our neighbors. And you know, I love this last part. In spite of all of these rich blessings, jump down to verse 24. 
Genesis 45, verse 24. This is crazy. He says, don't quarrel on the journey. (laughs) He knows that they're still brothers. He's reconciled with them, but he says, don't get in a big going back to dad. Don't quarrel. And uh, I just want to make a connection point here. Who can help me out with Ephesians 4.32, just as we close? Be ye kind. You guys want to say it with me? One to another. Even as God in Christ Jesus has forgiven you. Remember I said that our vertical reconciliation or forgiveness is the very oil or the very fuel that feeds our lesser offenses. Anybody here been hurt? Anybody here had someone post either by direct statement or implication something sour about you on Facebook? Or text something awful about you? Which may or may not be true, but you thought it was shared in confidence and it got blowed all out of proportion? And the fires begin to burn. See, I just want you to see that all of this is what fuels our horizontal forgiveness. Let me give you four points as we close, real quick. Because the kissing cousin of reconciliation is forgiveness. Forgiveness. Number one, I want to tell you that forgiveness is not a, is not a feeling. Now, I know we don't have ice in El Paso. I, grew, I, I was going through driver's ed in Sydney, Montana as a 15-year-old. And uh, during the winter, we had ice. And I was driving my Volkswagen Jetta around this little redneck town. And, you know, they, they told me that if you start sliding on ice, that you're not to try to correct it. You just move the wheels in the direction of the slide. And you know what? That just feels hypocritical. It feels... It doesn't, it's not natural. Don't, when you start sliding, if some of you are from the north, you just want to correct it, right? Well, that just makes it worse. And forgiving people doesn't feel right a lot of times. Uh, listen to C.S. Lewis. He said, don't waste time bothering whether you love your neighbor. Act as if you did. If we do this, we find one of the great secrets. When you're behaving as if you loved someone, you will presently come to love it. Can I make a, a confession? I love my wife dearly. 28 years. I have an awesome wife. But I can say honestly and transparently, I don't feel warm fuzzies towards her 24-7 for all 28 years. It's not all ooey-gooey every second. But you choose to serve and you choose to forgive even when it feels hypocritical. Number two, forgiveness is not forgetting. And you know, people say all the time, well, I cannot I cannot forget what they did to me, what they said about me, how they shamed me, how they hurt me. I can't let go of that. Now think about God's forgiveness of you. It says, and I, and I want to give you the, the Scripture here, Isaiah 43.25, it says that God remembers our sin no more. And I think the correct way to look at this is the fact that it's not that God becomes an amnesiac. It's not that God can't remember that He gets some Timer's disease about our past record. But it's that He looks at us and then He looks at Jesus. And because Jesus' record becomes our record, He chooses not to remember our sin anymore. He chooses to be behind His back. He chooses to hurl it over Vaughn's fishing boat into Silver Lake chooses to move it as far as the east is from the west. Thirdly, I think not only is forgiveness not a feeling and not forgetting, but it is not excuse. Forgiveness does not ignore the transgression. It doesn't overlook the transgression. Genesis 50, verse 20, the climactic verse of the life of Joseph. He looked at his brothers some 17 years after this event. I think he was some 56 years old by this point. His dad is dead and he says, You did intend it for evil. 
doesn't start calling bad good. He says, what you did was evil, but God meant it for good. Finally, forgiveness does not always bring consequences. It does remove the consequences in the eternal court. In God's court as judge, in terms of your judgment of heaven or hell, that's gone forever. Isn't that awesome? If you know Christ, that's awesome. But if a teenager gets a speeding ticket, a, a wife going to let that teenager pay the $200 fine or go through defensive driving. A rapist who repents may still, though forgiven by Christ, if they repent and seek the Lord, may still have to go through prison and or parole for many years, maybe the rest of their life. So forgiveness does not always remove sin's consequences. But here's the point as I, as I bring this to a close. Be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. You will never forgive your spouse or your kid or your parent who's been hard-nosed with you, maybe unfairly and ungraciously so, as a Christian, if you are not allowing vertical forgiveness to fuel that. You cannot all of your human flesh, and nor can I. You know, when Lloyd Jean Matlock heard that her husband, uh, Frank, who was a manager at the first cafeteria at Sunrise Shopping Center on Dyer Street, I believe in the 90s or 80s, 90s, and uh, he had collected the money, and he uh, went out into the alleyway as he was wrapping up at 8 p.m., and a guy shot him and killed him for the money back. There is no way that Lloyd Jean could have done what she did later on where she went to the trial of this man and she looked him in the eye. Now she's a 50-something year old widow. She has no husband because of the thoughtless greed of a young man. There's no way she could have looked him in the eye and shared the Gospel with him and told him that she had a posture to want to forgive him if the oil of the gospel of reconciliation did not enable that. Amen? Father, I do pray for those who may yet be listening to this and maybe they're saying, wow, that all sounds whatever, but I'm not sure that I've been reconciled to God. Lord, I pray that Your Spirit would open their eyes and give them a heart to believe the good news. That there is more mercy in Christ than there is sin in us. God, may that just ooze out in our relationships in this broken, fallen world that we live in and do life in. We pray in Jesus' name and all God's people said,